Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, after you've done it, and as you look at the, the peer review item in the uh, timed assessment module, you will have access to the model answers. But um, while you are still working on it, and uh, thank you to Tov you who've already submitted, but the rest of you, as you are working on it, if you want some hint, this is me giving that hint in relatively short set of words. So with that, let me just uh, spend maybe eight or so <laughs> minutes just uh, uh, saying brief words about uh, what's in the conceptual questions. I need to read the questions myself to remember um, what I was <laughs> going on about. So let's see, question one. As you have seen, it and this operate in cyclical processes because certain, certain things are unchained over one cycle, right, the state function. Um, however, it and this do have a purpose and some things do change over so list and explain. Uh, two things that do not change over one cycle with heat engine, it's basically looking for what are the state functions. Temperature would be one, pressure would be another, uh, <laughs> entropy could be another, um, internal energy is another, um, uh, mechanical put. I mean, it's, you know, basically anything that's referring to state of the engine wouldn't change over a cycle. That's basically what being a state function is about. Uh, two things that do change, uh, these are the things that um, depend on processes. And I think, uh, uh, I wonder, are there really only two things? Um, so I'm thinking of work and heat transfer, which do depend on which particular process connects the end point of the PV diagram. Um, there might be more, but work and heat, those are the two big things. I, I don't know if... Uh, there's more. Uh, something I usually have you list more things than I'm the exact required thing I'm looking for. Um, that might be it. Hidden, um, hidden work. Uh, those are the things that um, do change over one cycle of. So you know, heat engine does a network over one cycle, and there's a net transfer of the heat over one cycle. Yeah, if you think of anything other than those two, uh, do mention it and let me know. <laughs> um, Question number two, consider an ideal reversible Carnot engine that can also be run at this heat pump. Yeah, discussed there. Uh, diagonal ratios, okay, yeah, that's the heat pump, a pair of Carnot engines, the two are connected to each other, network. It describes the net effect on the engines and the surrounding over one cycle of all yeah, um, Well, it's a uh, uh, kind of zero net effect, <laughs> basically, the um, work done by the reversible Carnot heat engine can be pr this uh, work that's allowing the Carnot heat pump to run and the Carnot heat pump, reversible Carnot heat pump that's running basically uh, puts the heat back into the high temperature reservoir uh, and put takes out the exact amount of heat that was put into the low temperature reservoir. So yeah, the, the net effect is zero and you know, explain your answer. You know. But uh, it's not a trick question or anything like that, as long as it's reversible. No. So question three, our discussion of heat engines, strict restrict, uh, other heat engines. Yeah, this is a pretty cool video that shows the uh, thermoelectric thing. Um, answer, uh, I'm not going to watch it. You can watch it. Um, in what way? So. If I could give an operating definition of a heat engine, it's basically a device that uses flow of heat to do mechanical work. And if you watch this, it does that. It transfers heat from the warm cup to the cold cup, and it also does work from the fan that's turning, you can see. Um, so how does the heat engine continue running when removed from the hot and cold water because it's got those legs. Um, there's some heat capacity involved with those metal legs. Uh, why does the heat engine come to a stop eventually? And those metal legs eventually come to thermal equilibrium. <laughs> um, uh, because they don't have that much heat capacity, uh, not as much as the water does. Um, but yeah, you should expand on these answers. I'm just basically giving you the core of the answer. Uh, yeah, for Clausius' statement of second law of thermodynamics says that heat does not spontaneously flow from cold to hot. Yeah, I, it's, uh, I don't know, <laughs> kind of surprising to me that that needs to be stated as uh, some statement of law. Like, uh, yeah, it's like, 
Uh, what, what else could it be? Uh, but anyways, uh, verify that this statement holds for a working refresher. Oh, that's uh, um, fairly interesting. So I think so. Here, uh, I, th I think the video is helpful. So let me go to the video, and I can uh, show you um, the part where heat transfer occurs. So on. Um, so this is the back of the uh, radiator. There, heat transfer does occur. And the way the heat transfer, so uh, just before this back, there was this compressor. And this compressor compressed the, 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 the refrigerant, uh, the, the refrigerator fluid that's uh, on a closed loop. And when it did the compressing, that fluid got hot. That's why it starts hot here. And this loop is made so long so that it this fluid, hot fluid, can dissipate the heat into the surrounding. That's why it's so long and it's got a lot of surface area. So in that step, heat, there's a heat transfer from the hot refrigerant fluid to the surrounding from hot to cold. And in the inside, now, oh wait. Somehow this uh, thing is colder. I don't know if there's a step shown here. Um, yeah, compressor. Uh, um, there should be like something that sprays that it should show. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's one of the steps. Well, um, you should watch the video. <laughs> and uh, so in the step where the refrigerant is coming inside, I think it's the, this is the step that I skipped. Um, on this step. So here the temperature, temperature of the fluid actually changes. Uh, you can think of it as, um, so here it's liquid, here it'll evaporate into gas. So as the pressure is decreased, described here, the fluid is now made to boil in here. As it's boiling, that takes the it, that requires heat from the surrounding. So the boiled version of the, the gaseous version of the fluid is now colder. So this colder fluid that's now inside the refrigerator, heat flows from inside the refrigerator, which is cold, but not as cold as this fluid, into this colder fluid. So on that step of heat transfer as well, heat flows from hotter to colder. So, um, so that's what this question is getting at. When you look at an operation of a heat refrigerator or a heat pump in a similar sense, um, when you look at it in detail, at any time there's a heat transfer, they do flow from hot to cold. It's just that in these devices, there's a, something that does the mechanical work to change temperature without there being heat transfer, you know, adiabatic expansion, adiabatic compression. So that, that's really what this is feeling at. Um, okay, I spent probably too much time there. Let's wrap this up. Um, how does the entropy change for a Carnot engine over a cycle? It doesn't. It, that's what state function means. Is it possible for the entropy of a system to change if it neither absorbs nor emits heat during a, a reversible process? Uh, no. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Because uh, uh, for a reversible process, you had this expression of entropy. And that basically, so for a reversible process, this is what you've seen. A change of entropy is given by dq over t. So, and this is only for reversible processes. <laughs> so for a reversible process, if this is zero, then change of entropy is zero. Now, is it possible for the entropy of a system to change if it neither absorbs nor emits it during an irreversible process? Yeah, that's what free expansion of a gas is. Um, by the way, um, yeah, that's what uh, free expansion of gas is. And at least that's how we describe it in this class. And um, I don't know. If you are somehow getting your answer from sites like a check, uh, you will find some people describe it as throttling or something like that. I had to look it up because that's just a term that we don't use. But anyways, uh, don't use check. I, I don't think uh, check uh, allows, 
I don't think a check provides material to you in a way where you can actually learn it. Uh, if you need the help, you know, either ask me or we have learning resource center, uh, which has physics tutors. Um, I don't know if uh, there are many physics tutors who can tutor physics for me, but those are the resources you should use, not check. It's just check is the worst. Um, and it won't help you anyway. Um, okay, irreversible. Yeah, so I think I gave you an example a free expansion of gas. Um, uh, irreversibility described by the second law of thermodynamics, uh, more explicitly in Clausius' statement and entropy. Okay, uh, it's a unique feature found in other law, every other law of physics is reversible. Choose three laws of physics and describe how they are reversible. Um, you can basically choose any three laws. Uh, like, um, I guess Coulomb's law is what you will see next week. <laughs> um, you could use law of universal gravitation. Uh, you could use law of conservation of momentum. And in each of those, um, if uh, there's, uh, or law of like uh, Newton's law, uh, there you actually, so, you know, conservation of momentum doesn't really have something in there that you can identify as depending on time. But I think if you choose something like Newton's law, then you can see net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And maybe you're thinking, oh, there's no time, but there is. It's a mass times acceleration in terms of position. It's the double time derivative of position. So you can think about uh, replacing this time t with minus t for what the effect of time reversal is. And because this is a second derivative with respect to time, um, so you know you get this minus sign twice cancels out. Um, so and, and there are laws that don't depend on time at all. In that case, yeah, when you change t to minus t, then yeah, nothing changes. That means it's a symmetric with respect to time reversal. Um, and so any three laws will work. Uh, choose three laws that you can describe mathematically, because that's where you can actually do the time reversal operation. Uh, yeah, and when you look at the model and so I'll give you some examples. I think Newton's law was one of those examples. So, so yeah, that's it. I oh, spent, I think, more than eight minutes, <laughs> maybe uh, 12 minutes. <laughs> Um, so if there are any specific requests or additional questions about these conceptual questions, I'm happy to address them. If not, I think um, I'll move on to the rest.